I'm Jackie Lockie, your financial planning maestro. This series of podcasts is aimed at financial planning professionals and also those who are looking to enter the financial planning profession. We will be talking during the podcast about all things Certified Financial Planner certification related, talking to other CFPs around the world, and also we will be dropping in on some new entrants who've just entered the financial planning profession, and we'll be checking up along the way on a regular basis with them to see how they're getting on. I hope you enjoy today's podcast. Hello and welcome. I'm Jackie Lockie, your financial planning maestro, and I am joined by a new certified financial planner, um, and that is Stephen McBurney. And Stephen is a power planner at Wright, Johnston and McKenzie. Welcome, Stephen. Hi, good afternoon, Jackie. Thanks for joining me today. Um, we are going to be diving in, talking about your experience of your road to cert- becoming a certified financial planner, your road to CFP, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, long and winding road. <laughs> long and winding road. Yeah, well, we're going to get up to all of that in just one moment. But um, for the benefit of our listeners, let's dive in and start at the very beginning and tell us a little bit about how you got into the financial planning profession and the sorts of roles that you've held along the way. Yeah, certainly. Um, I think I'm actually one of the few people that didn't fall into financial planning. Mm. I studied uh, financial services at Glasgow Caledonia University, which was a a really good degree. It was very broad, uh, touched upon a lot of different professions within the industry. Um, So that was good. That gave me a kind of little bit of an insight into a lot of different roles, um, but it didn't really kind of give me an insight about what exactly I wanted to do. Uh, and I managed to secure a summer placement at a pensions administration firm in Glasgow, yep. uh, who, who specialised in SIPs at the time. And um, they also now do SASEs. Um, and that was a really kind of good introduction because it got me used to completing different applications, dealing with financial advisors, and also dealing with clients directly. So that, that gave me a kind of really good, strong footing. And and then what happened from there? So you were there for a, a little while. And how did you kind of, because I, I remember I years ago now, many, many years ago, I used to work at AXA uh, for my sins. And, and I started to realise fairly early on that actually I could be more used kind of on the outside world, giving advice to clients. Uh, is that what happened to you? Uh, not quite. So I started off doing the summer placement. Um, that was my first office job. Then that was quite a, a stark realization. I was like, "Oh God, is this what the what the industry is like?" It was um, it's quite dry, um, a little bit boring. But I did enjoy it overall. Um, so I did one summer placement, and then I actually asked back for the the next two. And then when I graduated from university, they offered me a full time placement. Um, so I was very fortunate from that point of view. Um, but dealing with a lot of different financial advisors and also para planners as well. Um, although they weren't really kind of called that at the time, it's more kind of sales support. Um, mm-hmm. So I did enjoy it. And then I, I kind of seen this opportunity to then move across to a kind of sales support role. Uh, and at the time, that was within a small IFA practice who also dealt with a lot with accountants. Um, and that got me into report writing, uh, sometimes like kind of preparing paperwork, pension transfers. Um, so yeah, I really enjoyed that. And I've basically been para planning now for 10 plus years um, at a number of different firms. And it always it always kind of surprises me how completely different every firm is um, from the, the structure of the organisation to the individual teams, to the, the processes, procedures and the advice as well. It's, it's all completely different. Um, and you read a para planner job spec and you're sometimes like, well, that doesn't really kind of tell me much. And it's only kind of once you're in the door, three months, six months, you actually get a feel for what they're trying to do. Yes. Yeah. And I guess it's interesting because you've got to find your place within the team and see if you like the culture and how it all develops, haven't you? Exactly. Yeah. And uh, I've, I've actually been at the kind of deep end a couple of times and I feel that's when I, I learn the most. Uh, one of the roles that I joined, there was a big backlog of reports. Um, so it was kind of working weekends trying to reduce that backlog. Wow. And the more you kind of, the more you do these reports and the more you kind of live and breathe it, the kind of better you are. Um, and yeah, it's just really, it's really, it's really good industry to be honest. Yeah. And so I guess you found, you know, did you find that reading, did you read a lot of other people's reports and, you know, the kind of previous set of advice that was given before writing your reports and learning lots that way as well? 
Yeah, it's really difficult because you're writing a report for somebody else um, and everybody's language and terminology and, and style is completely different. Mm. And what I might say is completely different from one advisor to the next. So it can take a wee bit of time to kind of settle in and build that relationship. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. And then obviously, as those 10 years or so have gone by, you've been piling up qualifications along the way, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, I've been trying. <laughs> uh, so it started off when I first started the pension administration firm, working my way through um, CII exams. Um, and it's quite it's quite interesting, actually, when you look back now. Um, I remember speaking to the director and having to fill in all these paper forms. This is going to age me quite badly. Um, <laughs> and then sending off a check and just trying to like the process and understand what you need to do and get into it. But now there's a lot more guides. You've got the the likes of next gen planners, which is fantastic. They've got forums, yeah, uh, and also you get the para planner group as well, and um, the mentor group. So there's a lot of support, a lot more support out there than there was when I started, which is really good to see. Yeah, yeah, there is, uh, and it's great. You know, I've really enjoyed, um, you know, reading all about the mentoring schemes and how para planners, in particular, are mentoring each other. It's not just a case of, you know, the business owners thinking, right, well, I've got to step up and. Uh, a mentor, you know, other advisors and para planners. That it's great that the para planning community is coming together to do that, isn't it? I mean, it's fantastic because just because you do something a certain way doesn't mean that's necessarily the best way or or the most efficient. Um, so it's always good to speak to these other people in different firms how they do things. Yeah. And you might not be able to replicate it, but you might be able to pick up a few hints and tips along the way. And I think para planners in general are a bit more open sharing ideas and techniques because I don't know there seems to be a kind of genuine interest to strive and become better and improve yourself yeah um I think we're kind of quite hard on ourselves generally um because it's not as recognized as a financial advisor role that we kind of try and feel that we want to be seen to be doing the best that we can yes yeah absolutely but I think one of the benefits of being a para planner is essentially you can you can kind of make it what you want it to be, can't you? You can take on, you know, push to take on more, you know, participation in client meetings, for example, or if that's not really your thing and you have a, a great communication channel with the advisors that you're working with and you, you're not really keen on going to the meetings and they go to the meetings, but you can still get the lowdown of all the information that you need, you know, to write those financial plans. So I think you can kind of mould it, you know, around the edges into what you want, can't you? Yeah, and I think if you've got a particular interest in a certain area of the business, um, lean into it because ultimately, if it, if they can support it, they will, um, and it'll keep it'll keep you more interested. Because if you're just doing the same things over and over, like bed and ices, they're not particularly exciting. And if that was all you're doing day in day out, then you're not really getting job satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And everybody has good days and bad days. Don't get me wrong, but you do want to kind of get a sense of achievement and. Sometimes you do get these horrendous cases, um, but you kind of look back on them and you forget the difficulty that you had dealing with it. And you read the report over three months later, and you're like, oh, geez, did I, did I manage to write this and cobble it all together? And we, <laughs> we got a really good successful outcome for the client. You kind of yeah. forget that short-term pain <laughs> yeah. that you've been through. Uh, I mean, everybody probably goes through it tax year end. I don't think MD's got an especially easy tax year end in, in this industry. No, no, absolutely. I can remember years back, doing some manual calculations for a case and it turned into six sides of A4 of manual calculations and then I accidentally made a mistake on page one and I oh. will never forget that to the day I die, I think. <laughs> but you learn from those things, don't you? <laughs> That's why I'm paranoid. I always do calculations on a spreadsheet because it's a lot easier to change and yeah. uh, my handwriting is terrible so <laughs> at least somebody else will be able to read it and if they want to update it then it's a lot easier than Absolutely. manually going through it all. Yes, definitely. Especially when somebody gets their big red pen out on page one, then I was uh, fit to open a big hole in the ground and jump in it. <laughs> but there you go. <laughs> so let's move on and talk about how you came across the Certified Financial Planner license and why did you decide to undertake it now? Yeah, um, so I've been a member of the CSI for a number of years now um, and I actually went down to one of the conferences a good few years ago down in Birmingham. Uh, and that's when I actually got introduced to the Parapana Interest Panel, yep. um, Parapana Interest Group Panel, um, which I'm actually a committee member of, um, which is really good. Um, and that also highlighted a lot of the awards you can enter into with the CISI as well. 
Um, and I'd never heard of Certified before, but it was really when it became relaunched as a level seven, um, I felt that it was a unique opportunity for me to kind of distinguish myself within the industry. Um, I weighed up looking at the, the CII route uh, and ultimately didn't really feel it was right for me. Um, because I've been kind of part of planning for so long, kind of knew the role, I felt that this would be a bigger test of my skills and be able, being able to prove it. Mm. Um, but then once I received my, my case study, I was like, oh, God, what have I, <laughs> what have I got myself <laughs> in for? Yes. And somebody said to me just last week on the email, thanks for providing all these videos and things, Jackie, with tips and things like that. Um, I don't know why you're doing it, though. And I was like, well, that's exactly why I'm doing it, because everybody gets their case study and goes, oh, yikes. <laughs> Mm, yeah, it's very different. <laughs> yeah, it's slightly different than what you were expecting. So what, um, you know, how did you find, what was your experience of the overall assessment? Because it took a little while, didn't it, shall we say? Yes, it took me a while. <laughs> um, it was one of these things, like, I, I really enjoyed it when I first got it. Um, I threw everything I had at it, spent lots of time. I needed to do a lot of research on the long-term care planning um, and also just the amount of time that it eats up is um, mm. quite unreal. Um, when I first started, I actually started logging my time pretty sadly on Toggle because <laughs> um, I had a short stint as an outsourced para planner and get into that habit. And it meant that it, it focused my mind because when I started that timer, I was like, right, I need to be, I need to use my time efficiently here, start yeah. the timer and focus on it. Um, and it's just crazy how the hours just just add up. Um, so I logged about a hundred hours <laughs> and then yes. after that I stopped logging because it was just giving me, um, anxiety, um, about how much I needed to do. Um, so my first submission, I used Voyant because at the time the firm that I was with used that. And I thought that'd be a really kind of good, unique opportunity to put into case a, a real life scenario. Mm-hmm. Um, which I thought in the long run would actually save me time, but in hindsight it didn't because although I had all the graphs and charts, trying to export that into the financial plan in a reasonable layout was just horrendous. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there was one point where I had Excel spreadsheets upon Excel spreadsheets and Voint as well, oh. and it just became yes. ungainly, unmanageable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and as tough as it is starting cash flow from start with Excel, I completely understand why the CSI want you to do it. They want you to understand how it all intera- interacts mm. and using off the shelf cash flow model and whatever that be, um, you're not really going to get that. Yeah. And it's a question I'm quite often asked actually that, you know, can I use my proprietary software for it? And I say, well, in theory you can, but everybody I know who has used it has had to deconstruct it um, in Excel spreadsheets anyway. Um, and then if you make a mistake um, and it doesn't quite show what you think Voyant shows, then you're contradicting yourself um, and you kind of go down this rabbit hole, don't you? If you can't, you you spend a long time then trying to make your Excel spreadsheets look like Voyant should look like when actually the test is supposed to be, can you create a financial plan? Not how good at you, well, how good are you with Excel spreadsheets? Exactly, yeah. And as soon as you realise that you're better just starting off in Excel, um, as horrible as it is, um, there's a lot of providers and trainers like yourself, Jackie, who will help you and support you. Yeah. Um, but it's just crazy how much Excel can do and how much I thought I was a fairly intermediate user of it. Um, it just felt like an actual newbie uh, coming into this yeah. experience. Yeah. But how did, you know, did, did the kind of pain of going through, you know, grappling with Excel um and building, you know, a simplified cash th- cash flow using Excel. Did that again? Did you, did that teach you any lessons along the way? Did, does that help you look at things a little bit differently now? Uh, I think so. Yeah, it's just one of these things where until the, the Excel spreadsheet's complete, then it all becomes apparent. Yeah. Um, so you spend a lot of hours just tweaking it and, and just sorting it, and you don't feel like you're actually getting anywhere. And you also get a bit of anxiety that you're spending so many hours on this spreadsheet, you've not started or you certainly shouldn't have started writing your report. Um, and you just kind of get into this kind of negative feedback loop. Yeah. But, but then once it all comes together, you're like, oh, right, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. And then when you come to write the report, it's so much easier. Um, I likened it to 
when a financial planner comes out a meeting and gives you all the information, or or even better, if you've been present at the meeting, when you come to write that report, it's all fresh. You understand the client a lot better than just having a, a file note and a key fee, uh, fact find passed to you. Mm. Yeah, it's tricky, isn't it? And I think this, it's a frustration that some people say to me, I feel like it's a test of whether I can build an Excel spreadsheet, not really a test of financial planning. Um, because you don't, like you say, you don't feel like you've got to the end until, you know, you're, it's the 11th hour. Um, but you've kind of got to trust the process, haven't you? But it's it's difficult to do that sometimes, I think. It is very difficult and you, you kind of fall in love and fall out of love with it. There'll be mm. times where you kind of feel really kind of energised by researching and feel like you're doing a really kind of good job. And then there'll be other days that's just really difficult to, to look at it, um, especially if you've got a busy caseload at work. Uh, yeah. private life as well um you just need to kind of put in the time unfortunately yeah. it takes it does take a lot and you yeah. need to have that discipline so do you have a feel for roughly how many hours the whole shebang probably took you i think it took me 200 hours um yeah. realistically um and a lot of that was learning about long-term care brushing up on things that I didn't deal with day to day. Mm. Um, that's the thing with financial planning. We're, general, we're generalists, we're not specialists, or a lot of us aren't specialists. Yeah. So you do need to have a very broad and pretty deep knowledge, um, and that just takes time. And if you don't know a, a specific area for a case study, then you just need to research it like you would if it's a real-life client. Yeah, yeah. And it's funny, isn't it? You know, I always say to people that financial planning, particularly for the level seven case study assessment, it's like trying to put together a giant 3D jigsaw puzzle. It keeps um, moving. <laughs> <laughs> it keeps moving, yes. Um, because, you know, every time you give, and, and, you know, this is happening in real life. I just think that we're not as conscious of it, that when, as soon as you give one piece of advice, um, or, you, you know, you're writing a report that's essentially recommending one piece of advice, you're automatically having a knock-on effect elsewhere, whether you realise it or not, aren't you? Exactly, yeah. And a lot of firms say that they're holistic financial planners, but they'll never, or, or my experience, they'll never have a, a real-life scenario where you do all this at the same time. Mm. And it wouldn't be practical from that point of view because it would just overwhelm the client. You you would break it down into into short-term, immediate objectives. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it does make you think about everything a lot more when you've got this finite amount of time and resource to meet their aims and objectives yeah. and to, to really understand the clients, what, what they want. Um, and I don't think, as an industry, we're very good at that. I think we're pretty good at gearing towards products because it fits our goals or we think it fits our goals. Mm. Um, and we get that kind of immediate satisfaction where that might not always be the case. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a very difficult industry, especially when so much of it's intangible. Yes. And, that, you know, when people have said to me in the past, so, Jackie, you know what? What is financial planning compared to financial advice? And you can kind of took them through the logistics of it all. But until it's kind of done to you, it's really hard for clients to really appreciate the real power of financial planning, isn't it? Mm, exactly. Yeah. It's very difficult to determine and show your the value to the clients. Mm. Um, there's a lot going on with uh, consumer due to them at the moment with price and value um, and they're completely two different things and at the end of the day everybody views money completely different as well um, everybody's spending patterns is unique to them um, we're not trying to tell clients what they should and shouldn't spend their money on but everything has a, a negative everything has a cost whether that's time or money yeah. um, and you can only do so much you've just got to understand your clients what do you want to do yeah and, you know, in, and in many cases, give them the choice. Well, you know, here are your two options or three options. Um, you know, it's less money and more time or the other way around or there's a compromise or whatever it might be. But it's, you know, it's about exploring, you know, those little nooks and crannies of the of what a client might want. And, you know, sometimes it's not about making a final recommendation because, you know, you need to have that interaction with them, don't you? Mm. And I think that's what would make the, the case study so much easier if it was a real life client because you could explore other avenues. Yes. But because you can't go back to them for a subsequent meeting or telephone call, you need to make a judgment call on it and explain why you've went down a certain avenue. Yes. So if you spoke to the clients, they might go, well, that's too complicated or I don't really like the idea of that moving access or or whatever it may be. Yep. Um, but it does make you think because you can't go back to them, what are the downsides? How does this affect this? mythical yeah. client case study 
Yeah. And I, and I think also, you know, is there a simple solution to all of this? Or, you know, am I making it unnecessarily complicated? Because some people do make their case study extremely complicated. And I kind of <laughs> find myself thinking, well, if option one is really simple and option two is really complicated, why are you doing option two? <laughs> I mean, it might be legitimate, you know, but, <laughs> uh, but if option one works, you know, doesn't that apply in real life too? He certainly, yeah, because I actually spoke to one of the partners here the other day about a, a potential option, uh, and the clients actually said to him that they wanted to keep this particular bit of advice simple. And I was like, okay, but I just wanted to kind of flag it with you. Um, and it was good because it, it covered it off, but the client doesn't want to do it, so therefore it's, yep. it's all complete the file. Yeah. So after a little bit of a journey, 200 hours work, and I have to say that the number of people I've spoken to on this podcast, Stephen, Virtually everybody has said it's taken them around the 200 hour mark. So you are completely not alone on this. Um, 200 seems to be no matter, you know, if you add up how many, how many hours it's taken you in its entirety, most people seem to get to around the 200 mark. Um, so how did it feel when you got your result through? <laughs> uh, and all honestly, it was more relief <laughs> than anything. Um <laughs> I just couldn't quite believe it. I think I put that in my post on LinkedIn. I couldn't believe yeah. it um, yeah. because you do dedicate so much time, um, time that you could be spent doing <laughs> much more fun things in your in your free time. <laughs> um, so yeah, just uh, elated. And I, th I don't even think it's actually sunk in yet. Um, still waiting for my certificate as well. So I'll be a lot happier once that's <laughs> yes. tangible, tangible proof. You can start running around the office, shoving it in everybody's face, going, look, look, look now. <laughs> <laughs> the pride of place on your wall or uh, on your mantelpiece or something like that um, so that clients can see hopefully um, in the future. So looking back on that process then, um, you know, how do you think it's going to change you as a financial, um, doing financial planning as a power planner moving forward? Um, I think it's given me a lot more confidence that I actually know <laughs> what I'm doing. Mm. Um, it's that kind of validation um, you try and do a good job every day, but sometimes you don't feel like, I don't know, you sometimes have off days. Um, and don't get me wrong, you can be qualified, more than qualified than a lot of people, but not very good at the job. So it, it, that's just like in a small piece of the puzzle. Um, but just a, a huge kind of sense of self, self-satisfaction that you've kind of taken this journey on and, and done it because yeah. not a lot of people do. Not, I, th I also think a lot of people give up after the first attempt, yep. um, which is quite sad as well because like God knows how much, how many hours people put in for that first attempt to then, to then give up. Um, and there's never going to be a good time to do these exams. No. Um, I think you just need to kind of commit and if you are if you are unfortunate not to pass the first time, just stick with it because it is worth it in the end. Yeah, as brutal as it is, yeah. um, definitely <laughs> stick with it. And we do find that there must be something in the region where about eighty percent of people um, aren't successful on their first submission. But obviously, you've got three submissions on that same case study, haven't you? So it's not by it's not a you know a one chance saloon, is it? You can uh, you can make the amendments. You don't have to redo the financial plan. Uh, in its entirety um, all over again do you exactly and you get some really good feedback as well um in the form of an, an excel spreadsheet um gives you a little bit of guidance on what areas you might need to improve on and tweak yeah. um, so, so that is a huge benefit as well um, and you also see where you've actually been successful um you might have only failed one area um and as horrible as that is nobody likes failing just kind of dust yourself off after it and kind of get back into it yeah. I was talking to uh, somebody actually who failed their first submission only a couple of weeks ago and they were like, oh, I've got to redo all these spreadsheets, Jackie. And I was like, oh, I don't think you will. And when we had a little chat about it, um, it you, when you look at the way that sometimes you interpret the feedback and the way that somebody like me would interpret the feedback are different um, and when I looked at the feedback, it didn't say there were any errors in uh, this particular person's Excel spreadsheets at all. And I said, actually, this is all about how you've explained your assumptions, which, as you know, Stephen, is my favourite subject. Um, <laughs> uh, and actually, they hadn't explained their assumptions thoroughly enough. Um, and then because of that, it wasn't the spreadsheets being incorrect, but because you couldn't see that the assumptions that were being made were justified and reasonable, 
then that throws everything else into doubt. So sometimes the feedback can look worse than it actually is because it's having that knock-on effect throughout the assessment, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. So you are quite heavily involved, as you mentioned earlier, with the CISI um, and with other things in the profession. Tell us about you know, why it's been important to you to give a little bit back to the profession and particularly about how you're involved with the power planning community. Yeah, I think it's just, as I kind of said earlier, it's important to learn off other people. Um, I definitely don't know everything um, and I certainly can't know what I don't know. Um, It's just, I just have benefited a lot from speaking to other people doing the same job. Um, And I'm kind of relatively older now and been in the profession for quite a bit of time that I do see it more as a career and I'm hoping that the industry sees it more as a career now as well Mm -hmm. and just trying to encourage people into it because people are coming out of uni and they're either going into law or accountancy Um, and we've got a fantastic profession in financial services um, and we've got a really ageing demographic of advisors that are going to leave the industry and there's very few firms out there training young people um, and it's just it's just a time bomb um, which is I suppose it's quite good for power planners um, it's going to be quite a buoyant market for them yeah. but but power planners are so heavily involved in, in financial advice and supporting the advisors that we really do need new new blood in this industry uh, and just trying to kind of promote the, the profession because it is a profession um, despite what some people may think mm-hmm. agree um, yeah. but there's um, there's a huge amount of effort that goes into putting on the conferences uh, with the CSI um, and I'm just a small part of that and um, there's a lot of people that work in the in the background especially the technicians when we're doing it remotely over zoom yes. um, that's a, a huge undertaking um, and most of the time it does work very swiftly and um, just like to thank all the people that do do a lot in the background that aren't really always recognized Yes, lots of unsung heroes in the background um, working their little socks off um, to bring all sorts of conferences, whether in person or online, to us um, each year. And I'm looking forward to, um, I think I'm signed up for, I think, all bar two of the box set that is uh, about to about to arrive, isn't it, imminently? Is it next week, I think, the first uh, one? Yeah, um, June, it's so long, it's, it's it? coming soon. So check it out if you haven't already. Um, sign up and make the time to to focus on it. Try and get away from your desk and and log in so you can focus on it rather than worrying about emails and distractions. Yeah, um, it's only it's only an hour. Um, if needs be, you can always catch up on it. But um, hopefully, you'll find it worthwhile, no matter what stage in your career you're at. Yeah, well, I thought the uh, the breadth and depth of subjects look particularly interesting this year. So I, for one, vote for as many people as possible to log in um, and. Uh, uh, and like you say, um, learn some stuff and also get that feeling of community um, online as well, um, which, you know, other organisations like NextGen and, you know, the Power Planner Club are all striving to uh, help achieve that as well, aren't they? Yes, but all being well, we'll be back to an in-person event uh, next year. Um, so it'll be good to kind of reconnect with people as well and get some time out of the office because yeah. um, it is important to focus on it because if you just have it on the background, you're not really taking it in so you may as well not bother and just kind of catch up on the record and if that's the case yeah absolutely absolutely and look forward to uh the in-person power planner conferences if uh previous years in-person conferences or anything to go by with games and all sorts of shenanigans going on um so uh hopefully there'll be some of those sorts of things planned for next year too um so let's wind up our interview today Stephen and talk briefly again about the Certified Financial Planner and so if you had any tips for anybody who's about to embark on the process um, you know what sorts of things would you want them to know right now before they kind of sign up and get stuck in? Um, Just do it just sign up if you've sat your level six exam and you're debating about signing up for the case study um, just sign up for it. Um, like I said earlier, there's never going to be a good time. Um, all the case studies, no matter which one you're going to get, it's going to be probably <laughs> quite horrendous. Um, <laughs> it is a bit of a baptism by fire, but it is 100% worth it and sticking with it. And once you get your case study, although you think you've got 13 weeks to complete it, which sounds and is a long time, um, you'll be kicking yourself if you didn't start it sooner. So just kind of just get into it and get stuck into it. Um, Because like I said, you'll probably need to brush up on a lot of skills, a lot of areas that you're maybe not dealing with day to day. Mm. Um, And 
don't try and use cash flow software. <laughs> um, stick with the Excel. It's it's pretty tried and tested. Um, I don't know anybody that's used off the shelf software yet. So it's already difficult enough. <laughs> don't make it any more difficult. Absolutely. And yeah. also reach out to other CFPs, whether that's in your organisation or LinkedIn or online. Um, and there's accredited training partners out there that are willing to help you and able to help you. Um, yeah. it's, it's very difficult, but there is support out there. Use it. Absolutely. Don't try and go it alone if you can possibly avoid it, I think. <laughs> it's definitely a message. Plenty of people out there to uh, to help you along the way. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you today, Stephen. Thanks for sharing all the ups and downs of your journey and many congratulations on gaining your Certified Financial Planner Certification. Thank you very much, Jackie. Love to speak with you. I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. It's really interesting, isn't it, to listen to other people's points of view about different things, all relating to our wonderful financial planning profession. If you know anyone who might be interested in listening to any of these podcasts, please pass on our details to them. So that's it from me. Join me again next time when we'll be talking all things Certified Financial Planner related and also dropping in on our new entrance to the financial planning profession. Bye for now.